John, great to see you. Thanks so much for visiting us here in Paddington. What's your general view about the UK's policy settings at the moment? What would you do differently, certainly on the tax front? Well, I think the settings have gone wrong. And so we have both an inflation that is too high and we have the threat of a recession we don't want. I think they're doing enough now to control the inflation uh, without needing a really big increase in taxes at the same time. So I'm very critical of the Treasury suggesting that they carry on with the tax rises they've already put in place and now suggesting they need another tax on energy companies on top. We are the only advanced world country thinking about a big tax increase at the same time that people's incomes are hit sideways by the huge surge in energy and food prices. And at the same time as the central bank is beginning to toughen up, remove the money, put up interest rates. You've got a long and distinguished history of influencing Conservative governments, being in Conservative governments. When it comes to the economy, which is really your area of expertise and focus, does this feel like a Conservative government, John Redwood? Well, I think it's a Conservative government that's doing the wrong things. And I have a long history of often disagreeing with the Treasury. <laughs> uh, my advice not taken in time. And then, unfortunately, it's turned out that I had the better of the argument over what was happening. So... I uh, remember being very against the exchange rate mechanism, which led to the predictable boom, bust and crash we had then. I, with all my colleagues, was against the excesses in 2005 to eight in the run up to the banking crash, because we were all saying too much credit, you're overextending it all. Then they made a worse mistake, which was they took all the money away too quickly. And they then had a recession on the back of a runaway credit explosion they were trying to control. So we had another massive boom bust. I'm saying to this government, don't do a boom bust again. Don't let the Treasury move us from what has been pretty good growth recovery just because there's a bit of inflation around to go deep into recession. I don't think you need a deep recession to correct this inflation. So what would you do if you were sitting on the Monetary Policy Committee, if you were indeed the governor of the Bank of England? We've had four interest rates rises in as many meetings, but still interest rates at 1% are historically very, very low. Of course, they're negative in real terms because they're much lower than the rate of inflation. Do we need to see higher interest rates, John? Well, not if they carry on with the tax rises, but I would rather cancel the tax rises and then maybe a little bit more monetary tightening because savers aren't getting any real return and they're still getting a very poor nominal return and it is very unusual to have interest rates this low for this long. Uh, but I would say to the Monetary Policy Committee, as I think they're beginning to do, back off a bit if the Chancellor is going to double up with all these tax rises. And remember, we haven't seen all the tax rises yet because the really big company tax rises come in next year. And that, I think, is doubly damaging because not only does it take more money uh, out of the productive sector, but of course, uh, it makes us far less competitive and so in a world next year when there's probably going to be less investment and less confidence around, uh, the UK is going to go some way down the rankings when people are thinking, where is a good place to put your money? Rishi Sunak's sometimes described as our most financially sophisticated chancellor since Nigel Lawson. He's clearly got experience in financial markets. How do you think he's doing? He's got a lot less experience in politics. Is it showing? Well, I think he's very bright and very hardworking, but I think he takes Treasury and bank advice on trust when I think they have lost their way. And most people now agree with you and me that they dropped the ball last year in a bad way, that they printed too much money and kept interest rates too low for too long and helped fuel a, a very nasty inflation we now got to get rid of. And so having seen that, I say to Rishi, understand, although you've got lots of bright and hardworking people in the Treasury and the bank, They've just made a big mistake. And you and I know in markets that if you've made a mistake, it's quite difficult getting back into the right position. You, you, the temptation is to try and correct the mistake you've just made rather than thinking about what the next position is you need to adopt. They may often be opposite. And at some point, quite soon, I think, we have to move from fighting inflation to fighting recession. But I think the officials are still in the mode of fighting inflation. Now, of course, we need to get the inflation down uh, it's going to come down next year anyway, 
assuming we don't have another doubling of oil prices and another massive surge in so corn, called base corn prices. Effects. The base it just effect, drops yeah. out the numbers. You've got much higher. Because it's a rate of change. You've got higher figures to beat. And so yeah. the prices start to stabilise. In some cases, prices are going to come down because there's going to be less demand, less work. And so it will get more competitive. So they've got to understand that they, they made the mistake. We're getting the inflation from the mistake, but it will probably pass. But they then got to understand that maybe for once the bank's forecasts aren't wrong. And we just had a period of six years when the bank and the Treasury's forecasts have been absolutely hopeless, as you and I know. But the bank is the first forecaster to say, hold on a minute. Uh, next year or so, we, we might get very close to recession. Yeah. Uh, and the bank is saying, of course, because of that, inflation will come barreling off. They think inflation is going to undershoot 2% within a couple of years. We'll talk a bit more about monetary policy, what the Bank of England does, interest rates, money supply in a moment. But let's just focus on fiscal policy. You have been vocal throughout your career, particularly in recent months. You opposed the 1.25 percentage point increase in both national insurance for employers and employees. Yes. Would you reverse that now? What else do you want today, to say? Yeah. I would reverse it today. First of all, it's breaking a manifesto pledge. And you don't ma break manifesto pledges on tax, in my view. Uh, secondly, it's a tax on jobs. Thirdly, as we've just been saying, I think you're taking too much money out of the economy when the uh, oil, petrol and corn prices are taking huge sums of money out of the economy and paying away to foreigners mainly because a lot of it's imported. So you, you don't need to double up with all this extra tax. Uh, but I would also cut the taxes on energy because energy is too dear. And uh, the people who are making most money out of it are not actually the oil and gas companies, they're the Treasury. <laughs> so a proper drop in fuel duty. It's yeah. still 55, 60 percent of what you pay when you fill up with petrol and diesel, right? Yeah, well, it's certainly the VAT element, which is related to the rising price. And, and why should we have to pay 5 percent on our hugely inflated gas and oil bills for home heating? When Le Brexit means we can remove that. Just suspend it until those prices come down a bit. I think in due course, the world prices might come down a bit and then you might want to reimpose it. But suspend it now to show you're on, on the side of people and recognise that you've got a huge windfall tax uh, in all the extra tax they're raising on the amount of North Sea oil and gas we still do get out. I think somebody's suggesting it's around 8 billion of extra revenue coming in from that because the prices are so much higher. So that is your windfall tax. So spend that on general tax relief so that people have a bit more money in their pockets and bank accounts to, to pay the bills. You just described as a windfall tax, the extra taxation you get because prices are rising. But of course, you and I know some of your colleagues, not least in government, are talking about the windfall tax, which is an additional taxation on the big energy providers. That's a mistake in your view. Yeah, it's a mistake. I, mean, I, I see it polls as being very popular. I suspect that most people say we'd love it because they actually think they're going to get the money. And I'm saying, yes, you should have some money anyway. <laughs> I think we can afford it. Uh, why don't I want a windfall tax on the energy companies? Well, because it's a highly risky business. Two years ago, they were all losing billions of pounds and none of us thought then the taxpayers should pay some of their bills. So why do you take some money away from them when they eventually have a year when they make some money? And on, and on the very day when uh, the press got all worked up about BP's high profits and said, you know, we really ought to be raking some of this in. Actually, they published a first quarter profit figure which showed an overall loss of 20 billions, one, when of, the you biggest, include the one of the biggest from, corporate losses from, from in Russia. history. And you can't just pick and choose. These are global companies and, and they're in very risky areas and their big bet in, in Russia obviously bombed very badly and the shareholders took the hit. Uh, I don't think that's the moment when you say, you're, you're dirty capitalists, we need to take more of your money off you. They've just demonstrated their high risks in these things. Aren't the politics of this irresistible though for ministers to take money from businesses that don't vote at a time when people are paying more and more for their fuel and giving it, it's not a huge amount of money as you and I know, but giving it to quote, hard pressed households, isn't it gonna happen? Well, I'm trying to make it easy for them by saying there is actually money to give to people <laughs> which you should do anyway. And no, it's not good politics in the long term. Um, mm. It's bad politics because if Britain gets a reputation of being the place where you come and invest, you lose money and you keep the loss and you come and invest, and you make money and the tax man takes a big extra chunk of it. They're not going to come. Why should they? Uh, and you never know which one is going to tip them over the top. But we've done quite a few anti-business things in recent years. 
I wouldn't do any more. Britain needs uh, world capital, world ideas, world talent to come here. Uh, if we're going to run this huge balance payments deficit, we always run uh, because we import so much more than we export. You need, as you know, to welcome in capital to pay the bills. <laughs> and uh, it's going to make it much more difficult if you get a reputation for being the country that ups corporate taxes all the time. And it's another reason why you don't up the corporate tax rate as much as the Chancellor is proposing. I think it, if everyone in the House of Commons, John, you're widely recognised as a very astute and experienced economic analyst. What did you think when you were sitting there listening to the spring statement when the Chancellor raised benefits from April by 3.1% while announcing then an inflation forecast from the Office of Budget Responsibility of 7.4%? And of course, now the official forecast is even higher. That wasn't good politics, was it? Well, no. I mean, the economist in me said, you're underdoing it. People in the lower income levels need a bit more spending power. Otherwise, the people they're employing with their spending are going to be in a tough spot as well. And yeah, the politician in me said, this is outrageous. <laughs> you know, uh, th- a this huge real term cut is too, too big for a squeeze. some of the most vulnerable households. So from that moment on, I joined those who were campaigning for the real spring budget which I still think we need as soon as possible to put it right. It's come to something, hasn't it? John Redwood, with all respect, you know, you're, you're, you're a fiscal dry, you're very prudent by reputation, experience, and may I say so, track record. And you're sitting there thinking the Tories need to raise benefits more. Yeah, and cut the taxes, particularly on the lower paid, and, and not, not undermine the manifesto on tax, because people in the middle also are getting very squeezed by this. And uh, they can afford both fuel and food, but they're going to cut out a lot of the nice things to have in life because those two are going to take up so much more. So, yes, we, we need to be realistic. But but I I also think you need to get value for money for the public spending you do do. So I'm, I'm always willing with colleagues to say, well, I wouldn't spend on that, I wouldn't spend on that. And the last one where they did accept advice and others were saying the same thing was test and trace had got completely out of control. That was a 20 billion a year spending program that had to be shut down. Uh, and then you, you're making a contribution to cutting the deficit by getting rid of spending you no longer need. Isn't Rishi Sunak showing his political inexperience here by raising benefits 3.1% when inflation the same day was announced as a forecast of 7.4%? That just, that's unsustainable, isn't it? Even in the middle of an election cycle when it's a few years before a general election. Well, I think it's wrong. And I think he said he's going to revisit it. And I would say to him, <laughs> revisit it as soon as possible. I mean, I'm not here to personally attack mm. Rishi. It's mm. an extremely difficult job. Mm. And he, I think he did well on the whole with the response to the COVID lockdowns, which was the biggest shock to an economy you and I have ever seen. Indeed, mm. when they described to me first what they were going to do, I, I just couldn't believe it because it was so severe. And I was therefore one who said, you need a lot of offset to that because of about a third of the economy is going to cease to function at all. We've never had anything like this in living memory. And they got us through that fairly well. Mm. And Mm. I think he could have been a bit more generous to the self-employed and very small businesses. But otherwise, it's a pretty good package. And yeah, some of the money was uh, misdirected. That was bound to happen because they had to move in hours rather than weeks. You couldn't go through the normal processes. Um, And I think generally it was a good job. Um, Now, I think um, you've got to beware that you don't try to become too orthodox too soon when you've got another crisis on your hands, which is second big event. I don't think you and I in our adult lifetimes have ever seen as big a hit to real incomes. Mm. This has just been administered by Mm. uh, energy and food prices. So again, you need to lay off a bit for that. uh, And it's outside the experience of Treasury officials. But I'm also against sort of Treasury orthodoxy in several other important ways. I mean, the first thing is I do not believe their view that if you put up certain tax rates, you get more revenue. Uh, If you put up tax rates on wealth or the income of the better off or the income of companies, you may send them abroad and you may get less. The so-called Laffer curve Or you may put them off doing things. You know, why should they bother? Why should they take the risk if you're going to tax it too heavily? So uh, whenever conservative governments have cut Um, income taxes at the top level or they've cut wealth taxes, they've actually collected a lot more money. So then we can say, yeah, we're taxing the rich more. Mm. We're taxing the rich more in a way they will accept and you get more rich people here and and they make a bigger contribution. So I think that's a very important sub-argument we're having uh, with with the Treasury. And the other big argument I'm having with the Treasury is uh, over 
How do you get the deficit down? You get the deficit down much more surely and much more quickly if the economy is growing. And if the economy is going into recession, I don't think you will get the deficit down. No. I think the deficit will go up. Yep. And so if they're high tax policies... More benefit policies, payments, less yeah. tax. If they're high tax policies actually plunge us into recession, they'll get the opposite of what they say they're going to do. And I'm afraid I'll be right, Treasury. You'll have a bigger deficit than you would with my rather pleasanter policies. A lot of people are saying at the moment that there's groupthink at the top of the British policymaking establishment, not just at the Treasury, also at the Bank of England. Mm. Do you think that's a fair criticism? If so, how can we counter groupthink? I remember when the Monetary Policy Committee was first constituted in the late 1990s, there was a lot more grit in the oyster. There was open disagreement. There were some mavericks on the committee. There don't yeah. seem to be any now. No, no, I agree with that. I think it's very disappointing. Um, and I think there's a big misunderstanding shared by a lot of the political and media classes about the Bank of England. Because uh, all we ever hear is the Bank of England are independent and therefore wise and leave them alone because you're politicians and you'd make it worse. Well, first of all, if the Bank of England was solely responsible for inflation, they have clearly <laughs> made a huge error because we got inflation four times the target. And they were still telling us a year ago that it was going to stay at two. And then they said, oh, it might go up a little, but it would come down very quickly. Transitory. It's transitory. Transitory. <laughs> so, and those of us, you and I and others were saying, that's not true. Oh, no, you don't understand. This is an all-wise independent Bank of England. But it's also just sloppy because people haven't read the documents. Mm. And in 2018, there was a new memorandum of understanding between the Treasury and the Bank of England because the only thing they've been using as a tool in the monetary toolkit for some time is printing loads of money and buying bonds. The interest rates have been uh, near the floor for most of that time. So it's been about money printing. And that has always been a dual control policy. The chancellor has to receive the bank's advice and decide whether he agrees or not. And, and it's not just, oh, well, I accept your advice, because he then has to take the risk, because the risk of all those bonds going wrong, which the Bank of England has bought for us, it's not on the bank, mm. it's on you and me, mm. the taxpayers the and the economy. treasury. And so it's a very solemn decision when a chancellor signs off on hundreds of billions of extra bonds to be bought. And you and I also know that the more they put up interest rates, the more we we'll lose on those bonds. That's right. And so they're in a very nasty situation now where they jointly have bought a load of bonds and they're now following a policy which is going to lose them money. A very distinguished committee of the House of Lords, the Economic Affairs a select committee with some very distinguished people on it, not least Mervyn King, former bank governor, did a report last year they called quantitative easing a dangerous addiction. Was that an overstatement? Well, I thought at the time it was a bit unfair because I was one of those who said there's nothing wrong with a bit of QE. Indeed, there's a lot to be said for a bit of QE if you're going to shut down a great chunk of the economy. But then we did more QE during lockdown, John, than we did in the whole of the yeah, previous I know. 10 but then, years. Then some of us said, stop mm. it. Yeah. We've had enough and you don't need it in the recovery year 2021. So then it did become an addiction. Uh, and now they've ended it. I mean, in fairness to the Bank of England and the, the Chancellor, they ended our quantitative easing before the Federal Reserve Board did in America and well before the European Central Bank did. Uh, and I think the Americans have got a worse problem than we have because they did even more stimulus and they've got a really flaming inflation over there, which is going to be difficult to restrain sort of a very strong economy. And the Europeans have got stagflation far worse than we have. So and they're still printing euros with inflation at seven or eight percent, mm. but very little or no growth. So they've got a real problem there. But we must concentrate on where the UK is. And I think the UK can still get out of this with a bit more growth and with some natural reductions inflation in the way we've described, but it's going to be a difficult course to chart given where we now are. I wanted to tap into your experience and knowledge of the energy sector. Um, until quite recently, energy policy was, you know, it was conversations between nerdy people like, like you and me with respect. Yes. Um, <laughs> but now people are realizing Oh, maybe it was a mistake to close down that huge gas storage facility yep. off the coast of Yorkshire at the rough field. Maybe it was a mistake to say we don't need more nuclear energy. How would you describe the state of UK energy policy as we went in to this cost of living crisis? Well, I think we've been uh, following a highly risky energy strategy throughout this century. I think it started with the Blair Brown governments and it then went on through the 
uh, the Cameron May governments. Uh, and we have basically had an imports first strategy because we've been trying to close down our own oil and gas developments uh, in the name of net zero. And North Sea production has halved since the millennium. Yeah. And so we've lost a lot of tax revenue and we're more and more import dependent. Uh, and then we've put in lots of interconnectors because we put so many windmills on our system. Links to the continent. Uh, that you, you have a no wind day and you just hope the French nuclear stations have got some spare power mm -hmm. or the German coal or uh, gas stations have got some spare power to, to bail us out. And that was always a very high risk strategy, particularly when you're interconnecting with a continental Europe that is chronically short of primary energy. And the, the scarcity of primary energy has been cruelly... Um, uh, made clear to us all because they were relying on Russian gas and now they don't want Russian gas. And so there's a great big hole where there should be energy. Have we so, been guilty of green virtue signalling over and above real politic, over and above prudent husbanding of you know, our energy supply? Well, I mean, I, I don't think it was even green. And I've been making the argument on the basis of the green arguments as well as on the basis mm. of security of supply because I've been pointing out to them uh, that if you import LNG from Qatar, which is one of the main ways we get gas, rather than your own North Sea gas, you create twice as much yeah. CO2 yeah. burning that because you've got all of the energy used to compress the gas and then to ship decompress it. the gas and to ship it. Uh, so it's bad green policy as well as worse energy security policy. So for years, I've been one of the uh, limited number of voices in the wilderness to successive governments saying, put some more capacity in and accept that Gas is going to be what you call a transitional fuel, and people are going to carry on heating their homes with gas for the foreseeable future. So make sure it's British gas and make sure you're collecting the tax revenue on it. Because that's the other thing. I, mean, I think one of the reasons the Treasury has now swung around on this to favouring a bit more British gas rather than foreign gas is the realisation uh, that you get an awful lot of tax revenue off that if it's home gas, whereas all that tax revenue goes to Qatar or Russia or whoever you're buying it from. Uh, if you buy it from abroad, which is just crazy. Uh, it's very popular, this argument, by the way, with normal people. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think this ban on new petrol and diesel cars by 2030 will actually happen? Do you think this whole net zero agenda will actually happen? Or do you think war in Ukraine, the reassertion of real politique, the, the rising prominence given to energy security will change our energy policy in the long term? Well, I think in, in the medium term, energy policy is changing. I mean, I think this is an area where I'd actually copy an EU change of policy because the EU have decided that gas is a transitional fuel and you need to use gas this decade mm. to heat homes and, and to burn in power stations because it's better than coal and you won't have enough of the alternatives available and working. So I think the UK should, should adopt that. Um, as to the pace of the progress on the road to net zero, I, I'm saying it will depend on the consumer. We all know governments want it and there's plenty of top down pressure, but it's not going to happen mm. all the time that Mr. Jones keeps his gas boiler and, and Mrs. Smith decides that her old diesel car is still quite cheap and sensible to run. Uh, you've got to infuse people with affordable, good new electric products that they want to buy, and then you can speed the revolution up. So I say to the government, you can't do this by laws, taxes, subsidies, badgering people. Uh, the people are voting with their feet at the moment. Not enough people are wanting to go electric heating or electric car. So you've got to work with business to develop the products that fly off the shelves. You don't have any government problem about getting people to, to have a a mobile phone or a smart pad or whatever, they fly off the shelves with no subsidy and no special laws because it's offering people something they want for their lifestyles. We need the electric products that are like that for the heating and the traveling. You know, when you've got a, an affordable electric car with a range of 400 miles and charging points nearby that you can use, uh, why wouldn't you buy one? But we're not there yet. And I don't know how long it's going to take, but that's my tip to the government. Sort that out and then mm. the thing will solve itself. Mm. This has been a very policy focused interview. So let me just end with a more political question, but one that speaks to your specialism as a historian. What are future historians going to make John Redwood of Boris Johnson's premiership? Too early to say. <laughs> 
we can just about work out the French Revolution's consequences now. But <laughs> you know, I hope there's going to be uh, many more months of a Boris uh, prime ministership with lots of good things, and then history will see him well. Uh, were it to be aborted too soon, then it's going to be a more difficult legacy uh, because he doesn't want it to end now, and uh, that would obviously come to shape how people saw him. John Redwood, thanks a lot for appearing on Money Talks.